Um, last time we did in class problem number three. So let's see. So there, I put a bunch of other problems that um, should be more or less familiar with the setup. Um, also, you should realize that most of these problems, or some of these problems, I mean, you definitely need a computer to do anything, right? So, um, is it reasonable to ask that you solve this by hand and even on a time constraint? Uh, probably not, right? I mean, think about you having to s even find this, the, the equilibrium of this system by hand. It's, I mean, it will be impossible, right? Because you have this weird denominator, so you're f this this you would have to solve a system of nonlinear equations that is very nonlinear, right? More nonlinear than <laughs> than uh, the ones we we talked about when you didn't have this denominator. Right? So we did talk about. I think this was a this is a predator, a plus and a minus term, right? So. So such a problem is definitely like a take-home, um, something that I would assign for a take-home part. But um, but but problems that involve this uh, optimization, uh, control, optimal control theory, uh, you can you know you can expect to be asked for at least setting it up. So going through the um, finding the. I mean, writing down the Hamiltonian, writing down the adjoint system, maximizing or, or optimizing the Hamiltonian with respect to the to the control variable. Um, so you may not have to do like everything, like put the dots on, on all the i's. Say, you know, this is my x, this is my um, this is my u, this is my x, this is my j. But but for instance, as you've seen in uh, examples we've done. For certain problems, you can very easily get, for instance, u, right? Um, so there are various kind of situations that one can imagine, like this is a Newton's law of cooling, right? In which you control the uh, room temperature, for instance. So u, u is sense of the room temperature, right? So it's a one variable state, one state variable, right? Uh, and you have an objective to minimize or maximize the temperature of an object in that room um, while minimizing the total terminology spent, something like that. Okay. Notice you have some controls. This may or may not mean what? That it will be a bang bang control, right? It depends on how the Hamiltonian looks like. If the Hamiltonian is linear, then it will reach its maximum or mi mi maximum at one of the two endpoints, right? Yeah. Um, probably a few days, or actually, I think till Monday, next following Monday or something. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm not going to let you go through, kind of digest this problem a little bit better, but I'm just kind of uh, talking. Oops. I guess I didn't tell you what G is here, huh? <laughs> OK, so we'll fix that. I think you get the same thing, right? Should be the same thing. All right, so it's your choice, your pick. Um, So notice some of these problems are, I mean, like this, this particular problem is a discrete dynamical system. And let's see, um, things like, what am I asking here? Well, what is this problem asking? Finding steady states. OK, so somebody has to give you a G. I'll probably give you a G. Uh, I don't know why it disappeared. Okay. 
Um, so find the steady states, find the equilibrium of the steady states, right, using the eigenvalue method. Um, and, you know, there are things that one, one should do, you know, maybe I should label what can be... I mean, in a way, it's kind of your job to uh, to figure out what can be done by hand and what can be done by, by the computer, what has to be done with the computer. Um, that's So, for instance, when you have to graph something, right? Uh, talk about what cobweb cobweb means, but if you were to, to graph the um, dynamics of the system, right? I mean, you can do that by hand, right? Um, so you'd have to maybe make maybe make a table or something. So, um, okay. Uh, then there is a there is you can have a, actually a harvesting in a discrete system too. Okay, so you can have some. Um, oh here, okay. No, I'm sorry. Can you, you can have a constant proportional to the uh, fish population, right? And I'm sorry. Yeah. So this this is not really a control. This is just kind of a we always harvest at a certain fixed uh, effort. So the question is, what happens with the dynamical system in in this situation, right? Again, assuming you know what G is. Um, let's see. I added two more problems. They're a little bit more uh, complicated. So. Um, By the way, I'm, I'm I'm hoping that I can I can give you solutions to some of this over the break. So, um, but bottom line is, you know, um, I think this problem talks about. Um, well, let me let me go down to the last one. They are not in the. Oh yeah, the continuous case. So, this is probably more familiar to you now. Uh, if you look at this problem. Um, so you have a savings account that accrues interest, and you can uh, you can reinvest it. So what is the problem? What is this saying? Uh, so a variable fraction of the interest can be reinvested in, in the savings account. So bottom line is that this this equation describes the um, x, the dynamics of x, which is the amount of money in the savings account. Okay. Okay. So for us, it's just a dynamical system. Again, one variable, right? And the the, the control appears in a in the right hand side, right, as a multiplicative, right? Right. And the problem is to maximize, what is it, to maximize, I think, the total amount of money uh, accumulated, which is, which is written by this in integral, okay? okay? So again, you, if you just ignore everything and, just, and I just say, here's a dynamical system, here's what you need to maximize, uh, do, I, do we have a constraint on you? Yeah, use between 0 and 1 because it's a percentage, right? I think the total amount of money, I think the sum, I believe. From the checking account, yeah, checking account. Okay, people that have business degrees or, or uh, economics degrees will, will really focus on the first part. What I, what I wanted to focus is on this, on these two parts. Okay. Let's say I don't tell you anything about anything. I'm just saying here's. I'm just saying this dynamical system, x prime equals r u x, okay? Maximize this integral with these constraints, okay? So 
So again, that's what I want to focus on. I mean, uh, of course, this comes from this whole setup. And um, and by the way, the previous problem is 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 actually, you know, because you you, you never really compound interest continuously, right? At least practically, right? So you you compound it with some uh, frequency, right? Daily, monthly, whatever, right? So this problem is actually the discrete version of this one. Okay. So um, so I would say focus on this one uh, as for, for the maximum principle, of course. Um, but if you look at the previous one, then you'll see how how those integrals, how those terms show up, and why. For instance, why why this uh, amount of money that is um, present in the savings account at time t grows at this rate. Okay. okay. It's because you take the limit of the discrete problem as the, the frequency of compounding the interest goes to infinity. Right. That's what it means to compound it continuously. Okay. But but again, for us it's just this uh, the setup here. So. Um, and it can go on and on. I just kind of gave you um, uh, a few that where again the focus is on once you have a dynamical system, right, written out. So hopefully you identify the uh, state variables, right? In this case, in this last problem, there are two state variables. Right, I and S, and the the con the the object the excuse me the control is this variable P. Right. If you want to change it to U, that's fine. But I think P stands for um, a rate of production in a certain you know um, manufacturing problem. Actually, it's it's an inventory control problem. So. Um, I is the level of inventory at time t, so how much things are in your uh, warehouse, right? S is the number of sales, the rate of sales at time t. So that's at what rate is are things kind of moving out of that warehouse? Uh, and P is the rate of production. So you control the rate of production, and what 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 could be a objective? Minimize the inventory or minimize the cost for keeping things in the warehouse. Uh, in this case, actually, it's the cost. The total cost is so there's a component that is the cost of producing stuff and then the cost of storing stuff. Okay? Exciting? So, uh, it should be exciting because you see so many different scenarios, uh, and again, you're not going to be actually asked to derive this. Okay, so you you should expect to be given some the, the the underlying dynamical system. It should be given, you know, you should be told this is the this is the control, right? You should be told these are the the range or the constraints on the control. Okay. So any questions on this? I want to go back to that. Some of the examples we uh, we had in the handout. Any questions about this? On the first one that you went over, on the this one. Uh huh. Uh, well, the initial setup is almost is given here. You know, initial setup would be to derive these things. Okay, so that wouldn't be in. Some of that wouldn't be in the exam. We'd have to derive it. Yeah, if you don't see, yeah, if if it's not given to you, then if it's just like a standard prayer to pray, then and I say logistic growth and standard competition or something. It's like in your homework, you just have to put it together. But but here it's a non-standard uh, way of, 
in, uh, of interacting between the predator and the prey. Okay. Could you say that in words? I guess, but you saw that it's sometimes it's actually even hard to interpret problems. So get the get this model. Okay. So so you, so you're so we, we, you know you're going to be given this uh, and just kind of do the rest. May, it may, or may not. Yeah. But the thing is, on the on the in class part, it's it's again, it's for this kind of problems, one should know. I mean, you need to set up. Um, well, not for this problem, but for the, for these other problems, right? To so I I, I will uh, you know I would, I would say up to what point you need, you know I want I wanted to do it. Uh, by hand, and um, it may be that you have to find the optimal control, you know, by hand or something. Okay. Typically, is typically solving the adjoint system is if it's easy enough, then you can do it by hand. If it's not, then, then it's it's a. Uh, well, there are still a few tools to actually solve a linear system and combine everything together, right? So we'll talk about this uh, more today. But th there are certain certain parts of the problem that are more difficult than others, right? So, so, so the best kind of the, the best uh, preparation for you, I mean, just from a uh, psychological point of view, is that you should know that you know these these parts. You know that can be done. They can be done by hand, right? These parts are not. It's not that you cannot. I mean, it's not that it's hard to do by hand. It's just like it's it's unreasonable to do it by hand, right? So, um, you know, that kind of the training that hopefully you get in this class is that you know how much of a balance between you know setting up on paper and asking the computer to do it should be. So. Still didn't get too many exciting faces here, so um, and these examples that I, I these four examples that I, I kind of uh, refer to all the time. Although, for instance, we didn't solve this one, the ferry problem. We didn't solve it explicitly, but if you were to follow the uh, the formulation of this, and again, I, this is that oversimplified thing where only the angle theta is is the one that's being controlled. Um, when you look at things, I don't know why the adjoint system is listed first. Typically you need the Hamiltonian, right? And then get the adjoint system. Okay? So Write the Hamiltonian. S is a constant. Theta is the control, right? Psi one, psi two. Okay, where do I have two psi's? Because I have two x one, x two, right? So it's in the two variables, right? And then you see when you um, when you try to find, there's no constraint, I believe, on the angle theta. Right, you can go around. You can spin around as much as you want. Um, so you just set it equal to zero and find the theta, which is the arc tangent of psi two or psi one. And again, psi two and psi one are coming from this guy, right? The only problem here is that uh, v. V, v basically is the profile of the velocity of the river, right? So it's it's kind of highest in the middle, lowest at the end, right? Do we say what it is? I think the problem must say what it is. Well, actually, it doesn't, but it's it's something that's usually it's parabolic profile or some some sort of known profile, right? So you see what what is the what, you see the complication here? 
just identifying the difficulties in each problem is is a big accomplishment because then you know where to where to concentrate. What is what is the non-standard situation that we're dealing with here? Come on. So so we found we found the the control right. Implicitly, it's given by the arc tangent of psi two over psi one. But psi two over psi one. No, but psi one is not zero. Psi one dot is zero. So psi one is constant. Psi one is constant, but you look into psi two, and you don't have psi two. You cannot get psi two until you know x two. X two being the Location, you know, uh, right? Uh, long, la, uh, longitude? No, across. across the river, right? So, so you cannot find psi two. I mean, until you find x two. But x two, you cannot find x two until you find theta. And theta, you, you don't know because they right, go in circles. Okay, so. I mean, to me, this is identical. Well, where is x1, x2? I think. Well, here's x1, x2, right? So you cannot find x2 unless you know theta. Okay. Okay. So, so everything that follows that stage is how can you do anything with that kind of scenario? Yeah. So I haven't looked at this yet, but is the answer that you saw like a <laughs> is the answer that we you mean the answer you solve uh, the four equations psi and the x's so you have a four plus four yeah right so so you do have so when you you start with the two equations you you add two shadow equations adjoint equations right you always are dealing with a double sized uh System, a system of, of double dimension, right? Right. So, um, and the other thing that that uh, happen is, you may or may not know initial conditions for all four variables. For instance, um, remember this is a time optimal problem. You want to get to something in in minimum time. So you're not going to give, give, be given any any terminal conditions for size, or initial conditions for size. So you have this four-dimensional system, differential equations, right? System of differential equations. But you're not given the four initial conditions. In fact, what are you given? You're given the two initial conditions for x and the two final conditions for x. I mean, the thing is you have to have always like number four. If you have a system of four equations, differential equations, you have to have some somehow four Initial or terminal conditions, combination of those four, in order to solve it, right? But it's right. So, yeah. So, so if you have the smartest, I mean, if if you have a smart kind of computer code that actually can solve those kind of things, and I'm not saying they don't exist, but I'm saying that you don't. Uh, and who knows? Maybe maybe at some you know 20 years from now they'll just say, yeah, of course, use the standard. Package, but uh, in the meantime, then you have to kind of work with uh, with each situation. It's very it's very much like Lagrange multipliers. Okay, when you when you solve a Lagrange multiplier problem, right? Concern optimization for just functions of five variables, right? With one constraint, you have one constraint, five variables. You want to minimize or maximize a the function. Then you write what the gradient of the function. I mean, this is this is that. Um, I'm not, I'm not trying to jump back and forth. I'm just briefly mention this. So, so let's say you have this function of three variables, and you have this one constraint, right? You're going to minimize this. So what do you do? Set the gradient of this equal to the scalar multiple of the gradient of this, right? You get a system of three equations with tra with well, three equations with four unknowns, and the fourth equation is is going to be this one. So you get a system of four equations. Nonlinear with four unknowns, right? 
How do you deal with that system? From your experience. Well, you can try a gospel nation. It's, really it's not linear. Oh. It's non linear. Oftentimes, you just kind of try different strategies, right? Elimination. You try to eliminate kind of one variable or write three variables in terms of the fourth, then use one of the equations to. So you do certain things that are, are very different from problem to problem, right? This means that you, you will certainly get a system, somebody can, you know, throw a system at you that you won't be able to do by hand, right? Then you go to the computer. Well, does it mean that you, you, you should always go to the computer and do it, regardless of how simple the system is? No. So you try to do the ones that you can do by hand, right? Maybe assisted by, the, by a computer software. But remember that computers, when you do this, when you ask to solve a linear system, uh, nonlinear system uh, symbolically, how do you know that it has captured all the solutions? You right? You have no no way of saying, it, right? So it's it's I don't know, it's kind of the same kind of feeling with this thing. So what was a question, yeah. If it's if it's time optimal problem, so you're asking about the. So by the way, remember you you're, you're going to have this is going to be the piece of paper that you, you can use in the exam, uh, and you're asking if it's a time optimal problem. Why do we always pick F not to be negative one? Well, it's simply because you're minimizing the time t, the final time capital T, and so. When you write that, so your j is t. So you can rewrite that as the integral from 0 to t of 1 dt. So that's all. I mean, it's kind of a. I mean, th there are many, many ways in which you can actually um, rephrase an optimal control problem. So, I mean, unfortunately, we won't be having so much time to uh, play around. But. Uh, Maybe it's worth to to say this one thing here. Um, just kind of to to make your uh, notation look a little bit better. So so um, oftentimes when you have dx1 dt equals f1, right? dxn dt equals fn, uh, and you have to you have a functional that is the integral from zero to the capital T of f naught. Can be um, rewritten as actually let me yeah okay. Maybe you have some, uh, also some of the terminal states. So your j is c1, x1, right? But you have an integral term. Then you can always write the following way. Then um, you can always introduce a new state variables called x0. And I should put it here in the in the in the top. Dx naught dt equals f naught. So x naught is now a function of of little t, right? And then this whole guy, this whole thing is just x naught of capital T, right? Because x naught of t is just the integral from zero to t of f naught of something d of course d d s right so it's the integral from zero to little t so what is the integral from zero to capital T? Well it's gonna be x naught at capital T. So it's like and then and then take a look at what the new uh, what the new objective looks like. J is C 1x0 
plus, you know, CNXN at capital T plus X naught at capital T. So, I don't know if it makes sense, but think about I have two, two variables, a, a, a dynamical system with two state variables and an integral uh, and a, an, an integral in the objective, right? Then you can actually make, besides the two equations, you can make a third equation in which you take that integrand and you, it's it treated really like the right hand side of this, the rate of change of this new variable, right? And then that integral basically gets replaced by the value of that variable at capital time t. Okay. I don't know whether I should get acknowledgments or... Yeah? What's the point? Actually, um, I think it's relative, but if you are looking at... Uh, let's see, which one was I... I was giving you examples of this. Um, so when you look at the... maybe... Sometimes it makes kind of your thought process a little bit easier. Um, so if you look through the examples that, as I said, like this guide has 100 plus examples. If you're wondering, maybe you're not wondering, but if you're wondering, if you, or if you'll start wondering why these objectives here don't really have an integral term. is because it can be always absorbed it, by adding one more equations, one more equation to this dynamical system. You can always get rid of the integral term. You can make it like a new variable. Okay. So I, I don't know. You know, you can kind of browse through this, and and you will. I don't know if you'll ever see an integral constraint, right? Now, when you set up a problem, it it may you know, it, make, uh, it may make a lot of sense to think about integral constraint because, you know, it's whatever, it's an energy or some sort of penalty, right? But I'm saying, if it's easier for you to think about it is, instead of having this, inter this constraint, you could, this, this objective, you could think of the whole thing as being minus a half times x naught of, of t, yeah. Yes, it introduces a psi naught. Um, very good point. Uh, it introduces a psi naught. Let's see, where was that? I'm sorry. Um, no. Come on, okay. Um, so, do I recommend that? No. I mean, I don't recommend it because uh, it, it will it will add one more. It will add an x naught, right? And it will add an a psi naught, right? But think about it, because it's always good to think about various ways, right? I mean, uh, of of rewriting this. So, if you have x naught and psi naught, uh, what would be the deep psi naught dt? Well, it would be the derivative of h with respect to x naught. But x naught does not show up in the Hamiltonian. Do do you see that x naught is? Well, it would be. It would be psi naught times f naught, right? But f naught doesn't depend on x naught. F naught is depends only on x one, x two, x n, and u. So, so psi naught is going to be constant, okay? And which constant? Well, terminal state has to be one because that's what a coefficient of 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 that uh, integral term is. So psi naught is always going to be one, 
That's what I'm trying to say. That's why you always see this f naught with not with a psi naught, right? Because psi naught is always one. I mean, in case you were ever wondering, why is that? That looks kind of this unbalanced, right? Why f naught should be? In fact, it's not. It's multiplied by psi naught. Psi naught is always one. Okay. Uh, in any case, that should um, clarify what I was saying last time. And it, uh, it didn't make much sense. But if you look in this other guide, and I'm sorry, I'm, you you should have a huge memory to to, to uh, visual memory to remember all this stuff. But uh, if you look at the examples. Uh, is this the examples? They're always written in what what these people call the Meyer form. So it's a, they basically always look at the objective function as being there's no integral term. Okay. Remember? Anybody remembers? I said last time. Uh, yeah. So for instance, this right. So so this is what this. My form, I haven't been able to trace if, if this is right or wrong, but I mean, if, where this comes from. But my um, form means there's no integral, right? It's been converted to an extra variable. Okay? So, so like this software, whatever this software does, it takes all, always, you have to rewrite it before you can put it in the computer. Okay? There's another. There's another uh, uh, advantage. You know, I can go on and on, right? Um, there's another advantage of thinking of things like this. C naught, but C naught is one. Where do you see these things? Where do we see these things again? Objective functions of this form, of this form, in linear programming. So, so you can always think of. Of this as being an objective to to reach a certain uh, the maximum of a certain linear function with your final time stop uh, time final final uh, state right so your so so this is uh, this is evaluated at a final state right capital T and it's it's whatever the linear function it is. That you want to maximize, right? But now you're you're following a dynamical system, so you're basically not hopping from vertex to vertex in in, in a simplex, but rather than you're actually following the trajectories, right? In the phase space, you know de that may change depending on your control strategy, but so that you're reaching a maximum of a linear function, right? And by the way, this is not the most general way of this is not the most general way of uh, I mean not not uh, the most general um, optimization problem. You could have nonlinear objective, right? You could have x one square, um, some some products, right? You could have a you could have a general function. I haven't talked about what would ha what would that uh, imply. So I, I wanted to kind of keep it to the kind of this idea of linear programming. You're trying to maximize a linear, a linear function of the terminal state. So again, it's, it's good to think that you can always convert from one to the other, I think. OK, but um, OK, so. Let's look at that example that was in your homework. So to finish it up, still nine o'clock. That's good. Um, so remember last time we, we we put that system in in p plane, and we said that something happens when you use zero. Again, this system is two dimensional, right? Because your state system was one dimensional. Oh, well, it was just one single equation, and now it doubles, right? 
Imagine what happens if you have a competing species. You have a dynamic system that uh, states, state variables are two, right, or more. So if you do harvesting in two populations, then you wouldn't be able to actually do any of this because your resulting thing would be four-dimensional. You don't have face plane, right? You don't have much of that. Uh, not only that, but what's the other peculiar feature about this this system that you're trying to solve? And, and I'm not pointing to the right system. The system is, this is the psi. This is the psi, the dynamics for psi, right? And this is dynamics for x. I'm sorry, you, you should have the handout, right? Which again, when u is 0 leads to to this system, and when, when u is capital E constant, it leads to this system, right? What's the peculiar feature about this system? Any of the two, let alone that you're going to have to switch between the two. Do we have initial conditions? We have. Yeah, so we have, we have an initial condition for x. Well, q is a constant parameter, right? Q is a parameter, e is a parameter, k is a parameter. Everything else is, it's only x and psi. We have x Right, so you have the initial condition for x. At time 0, you have x. Well, you don't have psi. But you have the terminal condition for psi and not for x. So you have kind of a odd, it's called a boundary value problem rather than an initial value problem. Okay. So, so that really kind of complicates things. So, so what can you do? Again, in 20 years from now, there will be the standard package which will do everything algebraically, right? And you'll be one of the co-authors, right? Um, Co-writers. But until then, what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to have to look at, kind of by hand, right? Uh, figure out when you have u0, when do you have u equals maximum fishing? When do you fish maximum, when do you don't fish at all? And that's given by this switch function. So, it was kind of very late uh, last time. So, I think I, I saved this. I'm going to just going to load this system, okay? So you see what um, what the solutions look like when u is zero. Yep, and when you, then you change u equals five thousand, and you you see how the solutions look like this, right? So in principle, you might say, um, why? It, let's see what happens when you don't do any fishing, and let's see what happens when you do maximum fishing. Well, since I, I have this for 5,000, that's the maximum fishing, right? I don't know why I called it a, a. Yeah, it says maximum level of intensity is 5,000. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know why I put the E as, as one of the parameters, because E is not showing there. So it doesn't have to be, right? I think the last time you put U instead of Yeah. Uh, okay, so we can drop that. So, so, but when when you have maximum level of fishing, what happens with the x population? And you don't see because you don't see the arrows, right? But you, if you look at the system, you know what the right hand side of the x, the x derivative is negative, right? Do you or don't you? Let's see. Maybe it's not that clear, but. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, is it clear that it's negative? I don't know. You have to put the numbers in, I guess. Right? No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're looking at the right, wrong place. Yeah. So if you look at here and you put the, uh, the Q, the E, and the K, it's going to be negative, right? Like you said, this one to the next page, your, your R happens to equal the Q times V. 
Right, so... Okay, yeah, so here, yeah, thank you. So this, this obviously is negative, right? Um, what if what if what if the agency sets the limit not five thousand but three thousand? Well, then won't then it won't be negative all the way through. So, but again, I just use that as a excuse not to draw this uh, using the, the 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 vector field, right? So P plane has this limitation when you when you try to do vector field arrows. You don't see. Not, I mean, you see something that's actually not even true, because because it uses it uses. Well, I don't know. The, there's a bug, obviously, but it uses the numbers ten to negative five, to negative five thousand. It's it's kind of that disproportionality, you know. Like like this is two hundred fifty thousand, right? And this is just from negative one to one. So it's not. But fortunately, when you when you hit lines, you I don't know. The rescaling is done so that it's. You see the, the true directions. Okay, so okay, so so again, it goes it goes down, right? Again, you don't know really where where you are on the psi axis. That's that's the problem. You don't know where you're on the psi axis. You know at time zero that you are at 115 on the x-axis, but you can be anywhere on this on this line, right? If you, if you You still don't know. You still don't know where you start. You start. It, remember, you don't, you're not given psi at zero. You're given psi at capital T, but you're not psi at zero. So, so because of that, you cannot. Uh, I mean, psi at zero is going to be uh, kind of as a result of the computation. It's not something. So, so before you do the actual computation, which actually I'll, I'll, we'll do it here. Um, all you know is that you're going to be somewhere on this vertical line, right, at time zero. So, you see what happens as you evolve? Well, what happens is you're going to go to the left and down. Well, maybe a little bit up and then down. Yeah? Um, what you just said about the psi thing, um, would it be enough to say if my initial condition for x was what it is, 150,000? Because of this picture, correct? Right. If psi initial is above zero, then we know that we'll satisfy our terminal. Is that true? Uh, we don't know it's going to satisfy at, at the capital T that's given, like T equals one year. Okay. But, but we know that it's possible, right? Because you see, when you see this picture, you don't know how long it takes. Right. So, so the, at capital time T, you should be on this line, right? Cycle zero. So the question is, you don't know how, how long it takes in time to reach from here down to here, unless you, you do it explicitly, right? But you're right, if you are, if you are, you have to be above, because if you're below x, if psi is zero, then you're only going to go negative, right? And also, you cannot be very close to zero, because, uh, you know, if you're really close to zero in time one, you're going to be way below zero. So you have to, f at capital time t, which is given to you, Psi has to be exactly zero, right? So, so it's conceivable that you're going to have something that goes, like from here down to here, right? Oops, down to here. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, the only thing that's complicating this is the fact that the, there's not a maximum. Uh, there's not a. Um, it's not clear that this is going to be optimal, right? Um, this is only for when u is constantly maximum, right? It's always maximum uh, level of effort, uh, effort of fishing, right? So this is a switch function, and I think the switch function was whatever it was. It was depending on x and psi. So I, so I showed you last time, but let's do it again. Uh, in the solutions, you plot the level curves of the function, the switch function. And what is the switch function? Uh, Q, I think, is defined, so I'm just going to use Q, X. P is defined or not? P is defined, yeah, P is defined. 
minus psi minus c which is not defined so I'm just gonna I guess put one here but of course and then you just put the values let's say zero oops I don't have a multiplied here okay oops QP size defined um, X is defined you see the variable X and psi last time it worked so I don't know why it doesn't work now but you, you did okay prob possibly yeah so if that's yeah this happens then just put 10 to negative 5 P okay so it's probably hard to see I mean when you when you're in front of the computer you'll see it very clearly so you see the the uh, this thing does this answer your question? Okay. Um, and we're going to remove all solutions. So, so that's basically the in this plane. Again, if you if you have two state variables, two adjoint variables, four dimensional, your your switch function is depends on all four. You have no way of of knowing, right? Uh, to visualize it. But here here you can because of that. It's only two dimensional one dimension okay so all right so so right now and again this is something I, I cannot really do it on the, on the board is is to decide now you see psi uh, this switch curve goes through z zero and x equals a hundred thousand right so one one simple well it's not simple at all. Uh, one thing to to um, to to notice is the following: is if you start with you're on the 150,000, right? 1.5 times 10 to the times 10 to the fifth. If you are on this line segment where x where psi is between zero and whatever this value is, which you can find, right? then you're going to have a chance of hitting the starting at this vertical line and hitting at this horizontal line, right? It's just you don't know if it's going to be in time 1 or not. Time capital T equals 1 or not, right? Yeah? If you're, ab if you're above the switch curve, then, then this, this uh, direction field is no longer valid, right? So you have to do the other way around. And, and again, I think you're going to lose this level curve, so you have to replot it. But if you remember what, what was in the previous one, it was like something like going like this, right? And again, does anybody know? I mean, it looks kind of weird, but so let, let's just remember this shape. But if you do zero, any any sense of why it looks kind of like this symmetric? Exactly. So x prime x the x equation doesn't depend on psi. That's a, that's a good point. So so the first equation can be solved if you know what u is. You can solve the first equation as, uh, independently of the well first, and then the second equation has the x in it. So then you need the, you need to solve the first equation first, right? But to solve the first equation, you don't need the it's not co coupled with the psi. Okay, the psi equation. Okay. So that that basically says what. Uh, I don't know if that explains anything about the phase portrait too much. It does well, a little bit. It's more like just depending on the Rx times 1 minus x over k. Correct. It's really symmetric. So right. For the stated values. Okay. So, so, right. So, so, and that's why I plotted this. What did I plot here? I plotted the x versus t for, for one of these, right? 
what does this remind you of? Logistic. Logistic growth, right? Logistic growth. Zero maximum standard population, right? And that's, that's exactly the point, that it, it doesn't depend on psi. So in other words, if you were to plot this for another solution, which we can do here, graph x versus t, if you pick this other solution, Is it similar or is it the same? It's, it's a little bit different. Slightly because different. Because if you look at about 1.5, it's about the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
okay, and see what what comes what comes out of it. So, again, the important thing to realize is that by staring at that, having that tool, it's a limited tool, you cannot give the answer. Okay, the answer has to be given by looking very carefully at, at how how much the x and the psi vary from time zero to time one. Okay, so for that. One should look at, and, and this is what is done here on the last page, right? Uh, it's taking each system one at a time, and that's the good news. You only have two systems to analyze. Because U is either zero for some time, or it's either E for some time. Okay? So take the U equals E, this is the system, right? How do you solve this? I didn't read much, uh, write much, huh? so. So when u is e, this is what the equation looks like for x, and, this, and there's an equation for psi. Again, the equation for x doesn't depend on psi, so you can solve it. Yep. I think the x No. No, no, no. This this x square is multiplied. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's important, right? Because it's just logis logistic growth. Yeah. That's I mean, that x squared is on the top, or is it? I'm sorry. No, it's of course on the top. Yeah. Okay. I mean, just put u equals e in in your equation for x. This one here, right? Yeah. And then, then, then I mean, Q equals R. And then Q is R, so that just those two terms just cancel. So it's X squared over R over K. Okay. okay, so how do you solve that? Again, the equation for Psi, the important thing is it's going to be linear, right? It's, it's not a surprise. It's always linear. So, uh, and I can write it down, but... I don't know if I can copy and paste. Okay, but let's let's first look at the equation in uh, in x. So how do you solve this? Separable, right? O D. So in x, x and t. So it's dx over x squared equals minus r over k dt. So you integrate this. So it's minus one over x equals minus r over k t plus um, plus a constant, right? I don't know, it's a different constant that we'll see from the cost. But it's a constant that needs to be found out when t equals 0. x naught, x is x naught, right? So this is, the constant is minus 1 over x naught. So when you do this, minus 1 over x naught is minus r over k t minus 1 over x naught. Lots of minuses, get rid of them. Flip, so it's going to be 1 over 1 x naught plus R over K T. By the way, this is important because this is now this tells you what X is at time zero and what is X at time one if you were to have maximum uh, fishing at all uh, uh, during that time period, right? Okay, and now the psi equation becomes psi prime equals minus PR, so let's, that's a constant, right? Plus 2R over K, X Psi. All right, I'm not good at memorizing. So minus P, oh well, I have it here. R, that's a constant, plus 2R over K, X Psi. But, but X is this X, right? So it's a, it's a it's a first order linear ODE in psi, but with variable coefficients. Now, how do you solve this kind of problems? <laughs> All right. So integrating factor, and how is that done? Well, you write psi prime minus 2r k x psi equals minus pr. And now you multiply both sides by e to the minus 2r 
over k integral over x of t dt. Okay? And I'm not going to go through y, but but what the output is 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 this times this integrating factor, right? Which actually can be computed becomes the left side becomes psi times the integrand factor, everything differentiated, right? Equals minus p r e to the minus two r over k. And again, you might very easily get stuck if you cannot compute that integral, right? But but in, but x is just one over something plus t that that automatically gives a natural log, right? So this integral is a natural log. Then with with Putting things, you know, the right way, e to the natural log cancels. So it turns out that the integrating factor, and I don't have it done here, but when you're done with this, you're going to get a psi of t is p times a constant, which is k over x naught plus rt. Okay, so there's some work that, that one needs to do, okay? which 20 years from now you won't have to do it on your own, but um, it's kind of surprising. And this is another constant, I don't know, constant, um, constant, okay? Okay? And, and actually, this, this is the constant that actually is not known, because you see everything else is known, but how do you find this constant? Imposing the psi at capital T is, is equal to Possibly equal to zero, huh? Well, right. Why did I say possibly? Because we don't know if this is going to be the strategy up to the last moment of time. Unfortunately, we don't know if, if in the meantime we made a switch, and we and, and our u became zero. So we're looking at we're solving the wrong system. Okay. And that's where the picture actually is, is useful because what happens is what's going to tell us whether we do a switch or not? You take this guy, psi, you take x, and you compute s. Okay? And I don't recommend that to do by hand. You can use your symbolic calculator, right? Just plot it. See at what time do you? I mean, at what, uh, for how long can you stretch this thing until until s becomes zero or negative or positive, whatever, right? The switch a sign. Okay. So, but you you can put that boundary condition in and get that constant. Is that, is that right? That you did. <sighs> let me let me. Yeah. Okay, but that needs a little bit of extra argument, which is, so I, okay, so I say it is clear that one can choose a constant above such that psi of t is zero. Okay. So, but that actually uh, uses the the following argument that to actually get psi to be zero, which you really want in the end, uh, your final time should be with maximum switch with maximum harvesting. But again, that's based on this, on this thing. Because if, if in the final stretch of your year, if in the final months of the year, you don't do any harvesting, you're going to be in this region, right? And you can never get psi to be zero unless you start with psi equals zero, right? Right? I don't know. It, it's a lot. It takes a lot of our analysis of combination of these two, but so then, then that's why you, 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 you're safe to impose psi to, of t to be zero and get the constant. Yeah. So so I removed the word possible. So so, so if you did that then you can, so you can find your you right. you can find your psi at zero. So find C from psi at capital T equals zero. Uh, 
I'm telling you, Lagrange multipliers will look like a piece of cake when you look back now. And you'll... Huh? Well, I, I ask you one of those questions, right, in the, in the exam, so... Um, okay? So now you have psi. And now you have x. And now you look at s. And you say, is s going to change sign between 0 and 1? And what do I say here? One can verify that s is always positive. Okay? Which means, so the conclusion of this is the following. The only, and we're going to quit uh, very soon. The only thing you have to do is, is with those initial conditions, um, harvest at the maximum, right? Start below the switch line curve, which is, you know, you, you see it, right? Okay, and uh, and you go, you're gonna go from from this vertical 1.5 down to zero, uh, cycle zero. Okay, and that's gonna be the optimal strategy. Maximum harvesting. Yeah. We'll never satisfy the. Oh yeah. Um, I okay. So I think I think that question you can interpret it uh, as follows. Don't. I mean, it's it's ideal if you can find the range of x naught, but I think if you can tell me what happens when x naught is fifty thousand is is not one hundred fifty thousand but fifty thousand. Yeah. Then I'll be satisfied. But of course. Then you can ask, you know, what happens if you're 100,000 initially? You think you start here? I, I, I don't think so, because you can still go a little bit this way with no fishing, and then you do harvest, harvesting. So you, there's going to be a curve that is going to require one switch during the year. You can. If you, if you look at the explicit solution, you can. But it's difficult. I'm I'm okay for the homework purpose just to look at the fifty thousand and two fifty thousand. Okay, uh, that's what I think I say. Yeah, I always ask for more. Okay. So I I I, sh I want to I want to get the homework by Friday so I can give you solutions and. Um, so I'll post the solutions Friday, I don't know, afternoon, so I want it by noon. Is it okay? And it's okay to use scissors and uh, glue? Paper glue? No, I'm serious.